the city of Tacoma's historic preservation office, in association with Pretty Gritty Tours, presents Tacoma Noir. Private investigator Ray Rook sat alone in the dark of his office, looking out the window. A feral December wind clawed at the panes of glass. The gust coiled around the tall building like the eddies of an icy river around the corners of a boulder. It seemed to pull the color from the skyline with it and the whole of Tacoma felt a little grayer. The lights that usually blazed in the city, keeping the darkness at bay, were notably mute tonight. The only warmth in this whole city, it seemed, came from the whiskey in his glass. It was 1929 and it was a dry year in a dry city. It hadn't rained in almost 11 months, unheard of in a place like Tacoma. The dams had run dry and the lights were off. The electrical grid had crashed like the stock market in October. It felt like all hope in this backward town had evaporated, lapped up by the hungry wind howling at Ray's window. The only moisture you could find was in the back room bars. From Ray's perch in downtown, he could see the waterfront, and there along Baker Dock was Tacoma's last hope, tied up to the pier to keep it from slipping away. She was at the moment, the finest Lady Ray Rook had seen in some time. The USS Lexington, or Lady Lex as she was known, was a US aircraft carrier and she'd arrived last night. The massive ship was a Hail Mary, Ira Davison, the superintendent of power for the area, had somehow persuaded President Hoover to send the Lady Lex as a last chance for Tacoma when the power ran out. Her onboard generators would power Tacoma until the rains came. Ray took out a cigarette and doubted much would change. After Black Tuesday when the market fell apart, business was good for a private investigator like Ray Rook. There were no shortages of missing people to occupy his time. As if in response to his dark thoughts, the cold December sky blew sharply on the window, and the thin pane threatened to give way. The light of his cigarette blazed in response, and he let the flame of his lighter linger a moment longer in defiance before snapping it shut. Down below, the joy of the Lady Lex was leeching out onto the streets. Sailors in dazzling navy whites and blues poured from the ship. There were some 1,400 of them on board, and they had arrived as triumphant heroes here in Tacoma the night before. The music from the bands there to greet them had been deafening, though not as loud as the cheers from the young women along the dock. A triumphant roar rose up from the streets below, and Ray saw the dark billow of smoke come up from the Lexington and the dull shimmer of lights across the city. With a sputter, then a roar, Tacoma came back to life. The color ever so slightly returning like the blush of a young lover on a cold winter day. Ray was snapped from his observations by a sharp knock on his door. Yeah. Ray Rook's secretary, Betty, peeked her head around the door. Ray, City Commissioner Baldwin is here. Ray pulled a drag of his cigarette deep into his lungs and tried to hold that warmth in preparation for the storm he felt was coming. I'll show him in, Betty. Betty shot Ray a glance of momentary shock before regaining her composure and nodded to him. Mr. Rook will see you now, Commissioner Baldwin. Ray clicked on his lamp for the first time in weeks and sat down at his desk, as a tall man slid into his office like a lengthening shadow at dusk. He wore a dark coat with thick fur collar that looked like a wolverine slept lightly at his throat. A dark spread of hair glistened like a pool of oil across his head and matched the pencil-thin mustache that perched on his lip like a bit of ash smudged on his thin lips. Hello, Mr. Rook. I am Commissioner Walter Baldwin. His voice had the charm of a metal door dragged across concrete. Ray winced in spite of himself and took a slow drag of his cigarette before nodding. I know who you are. Tacoma City Commissioners change like the seasons, but they're good enough to keep the forecast in the papers for me. Walter's face soured like a dish of milk left out. Indeed! It's been a tumultuous year! Mayor Melvin Tennant had just defeated longtime favorite Angelo Fawcett and then promptly resigned during a heated city council meeting, leaving James Newbegin as the acting mayor of the city in chaos. City commissioners were just as chaotic. What brings a member of the city council to my office? Indeed to the point! I have a particularly sensitive matter that I need you to look into for me. 
I was told that you were the man for discretion and professionalism. Ray poured himself a deep glass of whiskey and wordlessly offered the bottle and a fresh glass to Walter Baldwin, who shook his head. As I am sure you are aware, the Volstead Act prohibits the consumption of alcohol here in our great nation. Ray nodded as Walter took the offered glass and drank deeply. Professional and discreet? And maybe one of those two things on any given day. I should think that the commissioner would have the Tacoma Police Department and its fine roster of detectives to help him with any issues he might need looked at. There's a very real chance that one of our police officers is implicit in the situation I need looked at. I'm very much in need of someone. Expendable? Walter scoffed under his breath. <laughs> Independent of the city. Ray took a drink of his whiskey and took the measure of the man across from him, his cool gaze searching for a clue as to his intentions. What's the job? I was contacted yesterday by an anonymous source that informed me there would be a murder in Tacoma that would put our whole city in jeopardy. Sounds like you've got the case closed. Why not just have the person who told you about the murder arrested? Walter Baldwin swallowed the whole of his whiskey and looked momentarily like a python, digesting a truth larger than itself. Not to put too fine a point on it, but she's dead. Ray raised his eyebrows and looked across the desk at the city commissioner. Walter produced a manila folder and slid it across the desk to Ray Rook. Ray picked up the folder and looked inside. There was a delicate letter with a faint floral scent to it. The text was neatly typed. It read, Commissioner Baldwin, every day the Lexington darkens our port, the cold hands of the dead will choke this city. No one is safe from their grasp. I will claim one life tonight and another tomorrow. It was signed, Rebecca Carr. Inside was also a card, twice as large as a playing card with a skeleton holding what looked like the lid of a coffin in its hand, reaching for the skies it stepped out of a grave. Boldly across the skeletal forehead was etched a crescent moon. There was a slight acrid smell on the card and it had a smooth texture like graphite. Ray laughed a little. <laughs> The sound was rusty and stiff like he hadn't done it in some time. Rebecca Carr had been Tacoma's most famous clairvoyant. She had convinced the city of her prowess for decades, eventually foretelling, or guessing as Ray assumed, that major events again and again would happen here. The biggest problem Ray could see with the letter was that Rebecca Carr had died in 1908, 21 years ago. Sounds like you need a priest, not a PI. Mr. Rook, I wouldn't normally pay any heed to these threats. You don't become a city council member in Tacoma by worrying about wild bluffs and intimidations, but this particular situation has become more acute in the last two hours. Are you looking for the author of this letter? Two hours ago, the body of one of the sailors from on board the Lexington was found in an alley downtown. He had one of those same cards on him. This has now become a very sensitive issue, and I am unsure who I can trust. I will pay you double your normal rate, Mr. Rook, but you need to find out who is behind this. And quickly, nothing can jeopardize the presence of the Lexington here right now. Our mayor, pro tempore, Newbegin, has his hands full right now. And the USS Lexington is the only thing keeping the lights on. Ray Rook took out a cigarette. While well, he flipped the card over in his hand, he clicked his lighter and said, All right, Commissioner Baldwin. I'll take the job. Tell me where the body is. Ray Rook found himself standing in a dark alley behind Whiskey Row in downtown Tacoma. The bright jazz of the underground speared the belly of the darkness and mocked the sharp edge of the dry wind that prowled behind Ray. In front of him was the crime scene. 
Several officers were doing their best to contain the area and push the crush of drunken looky-loos past the body. Ray could hear the rough baying of Chief Detective Charles Byrne barking at passers-by. Keep moving, just a drunk! Flinders, get this alley locked down! You keep gawking, you'll get a stiff pistol whip! Charles Byrne looked like a mastiff stuffed hastily into a police uniform, and the large revolver at his waist remained unsnapped and ready to fly out like an alley cat with its hackles up. When he saw Ray standing on the edge of the crime scene, he strode right towards him like a rogue wave. Jesus Christ, Ray, Jesus Christ, what are you doing here? Can you smell disaster or something? Why is it every time I got a pile like this dropped on my doorstep, I find you sticking around like stench on death? First this woman, now you. Hi, Charles. Ray, I hope you have good news for me. This city has been on the ragged edge of keeping itself together. It feels like we got a new mayor every month. The market's crashed. I'm picking up bodies off the street every night. The absolute last thing I need right now is this. Was he from the Lexington? And what woman? Charles stopped for a moment and his jaws snapped shut. His eyes narrowed at Ray. Tell me that was a lucky guess, Ray. I can't have more psychics tonight. Would you believe me if I told you the ghost of Rebecca Carr told me? Charles shivered in spite of himself, and his hand reflexively went to the medallion of St. Michael hanging from his vest pocket. Maybe you need to come look at this, Ray. Charles led Ray over to a body in the middle of the alley that had been covered with a sheet. Several officers were scrambling to set up a perimeter around the street. One of them pulled back the sheet to reveal the pallid and lifeless complexion of a young man, maybe 19, with a blue navy uniform and golden anchors at his throat. He was soaking wet and there was a pool of water around him. His jacket and pants had mud smeared all along the fabric. On the surface of the pool was an oily sheen. Tucked neatly on the uniform's jacket was a card with a skeleton emerging from the grave, identical to the one that the Commissioner Baldwin had received. There was a light odor of rot all around. Pockets? Naval ID. Matches, a small blade... $34.16, $34.16, mints, and this watch. Looks like his name is Ensign Jimmy Ashcraft. Ray looked the stiff up and down. Around the alley was the general confetti of waste that accompanies a heavy news day and a parade in town. The street sweepers would be out tomorrow to erase what little was left out there. There was a nearby bolt that caught Ray's attention, and he went to examine it. It was heavy, large as a chestnut and covered in some sort of petroleum jelly, Ray thought. He placed it in his pocket and went over to Charles, who was talking to the coroner. The local coroner was a wisp of a man named Jeffrey Arthur. Ray thought he looked more like the bodies he examined than a living man. His thinning hair and slender frame were bound together by a simple brown suit and a coat Ray thought must be far too cold for this winter. Jeffrey nodded as Ray approached. Rook, what's your thinking on this one? My initial thought was this young man drowned, but I will need to conduct a thorough examination at the morgue before I can say for certain. There's no signs of trauma, and no blood. Also, there's no water. How does a guy drown in an alley during a drought? Ray felt the air change for a moment, and let himself dare to believe it might be rain. When he looked up, he realized it was a storm coming, but not one to bring an end to a long dry spell. Ray saw a woman round the corner with the grace of a large cat. She moved noiselessly across the street. Her dark hair coiled in serpentine locks around her face and her eyes were dark, but sparkled with a firework display of reflected light, like a meteor shower on a moonless night. She wore a dress of sable so soft it seemed to be made of shadows. She moved like the tide, sure but subtle. Ray thought he needed to keep his footing so he didn't get sucked into the undertow. By her side, a man in his fifties, clean-cut with a robust half-moon mustache balanced on his lip. His sad eyes curved equally downward, and he very much had the appearance of a stack of papers placed precariously on the side of a desk, like the slightest bump might send his whole life into chaos on the floor. The woman walked lightly beside him, and surveyed the crime scene with her head tilted ever so slightly to side, as if she were trying to detect a tune in the distance. She looked like a woman with a past, but Ray couldn't help but thinking about his future. Ray slowly pulled a cigarette from his jacket pocket and went to light it. (sighs) Council Roberts. The detective made way for the two newcomers without any sense of relief or joy showing on his face. 
The man with the mustache nodded to Charles and made his way into the center of the group. Ray recognized him as the chief counsel for City Hall. Detective Bryn, I had very clear instructions for the police that there were to be no incidents to jeopardize the arrival of the Lexington here in Tacoma. Charles looked like he was going to snarl, but was cut off. As it stands, we may now be at the mercy of powerful techniques that are foreign to our usual efforts. With a gesture, he waved casually to the woman at his side. May I introduce Miss Ada Kincaid? A pleasure, I'm sure. Ada spoke to Charles, but kept her dark gaze on Ray. Council Roberts, this is no place for a dame. I assure you, Detective Byrne, I'm no stranger to death. Ray believed her. She knelt by the body and examined it the way a cat looks at a mouse trapped beneath its paw. Miss Kincaid is working for me. She is the city's foremost clairvoyant. Since this matter is now of the utmost priority, we must rely on any alternative methods. And who exactly is this, Charles? He's an alternative. Ray's been a great asset to the department over the years as a private investigator. No offense to you, ma'am, but Roberts, are you serious about this? I assure you, Miss Kincaid has solved more than one mystery in her time, and is respected as a paragon in the spiritualist communities. It's because of her abilities that we are here now. Can you say the same for your man here? Is the police force so thin that it has resorted to outsourcing its workload? Ray just happened to be in the area. Gentlemen, I'm sure Mr. Rook, was it? Won't be any problem for us. I can see his path very clearly. From the corner of his eye, Ray Rook noticed a young man in a uniform, similar to the dead man's, on the far edge of the substation that lined the alley. He lingered at the back of the group of onlookers that the officers were pushing back. His face was ghostly white and his eyes were wild. When he noticed Ray looking at him, he quickly turned and vanished into the darkness and headed towards the Tacoma Hotel. Ray turned to pursue him without looking back at Charles or his new companions. He was a falcon in pursuit of its prey. In his haste, he missed the smooth smile that turned the corner of Ada Kincaid's crimson lipstick up along her face. Where are you going, Rook? Ray looked back over his shoulder. I've got a lead, Charles. I'll be in touch. Ray, wait, Ray. What's going on here? Jesus Christ, Ray. Ray Rook had already gone down the alley and was heading south towards the far edge of the city block. Behind him, he could hear the party warming up on Whiskey Row as a whole ship of sailors emptied out into the city that was all too happy to see them come. Ray caught sight of the kid in uniform across the street as he ducked into another alley. Ray double-timed along the side street and cut across the lot to cut him off. They emerged on the corner at the same time and the young man almost collided with Ray. Where are you off to tonight? Please. Please. I'm in danger. I need to go back to the ship. Oh, slow down, kid. Let's see what this is all about. Ray Rook took out his private investigator badge and flashed it to the sailor, being careful to also give the kid a glimpse of his Colt 1911 that nestled inside Ray's coat. The name's Ray Rook. I'm investigating the events downtown tonight. You know anything about the guy back there? Yes. Well, no. I knew him. Jesus, is he really dead? It's, it's just like she said. Who said? The woman. Miss Kincaid. She said Jimmy was going to die here and that I would be next. I didn't... I mean... Listen, I wasn't doing anything. I just had questions. Slow down. You look like you could use a drink, kid. Ray moved around the young man in front of him and grabbed his arm gently, but with conviction, piloting him towards the hotel. They entered the lobby together and stopped when they arrived at the restaurant inside. Why don't we sit down and you can explain this to me? The shock seemed to be draining from his face as they entered the warm light of the Tacoma Hotel. Ray signaled to the waitress and brought the kid over to a table on the edge of the dining hall. Let's start with who are you? I'm Ensign Robert Heinlein aboard the USS Lexington. Good start. Now, what are you doing out here? Robert looked around the hotel dining area and after surveying for danger, seemed to calm a little. Sir, there's a ghost going to kill me. <laughs> she told me that the ghost was going to kill Jimmy and as I was walking back to the ship, there he was. There she was. Jesus, we had just left. Just like she said, she knew. Who's this woman? Ray had produced a small notebook and a cigarette. 
Miss Kincaid, the psychic. She's a spiritualist. Some of the boys and I went to see her. There were offers when we got off the ship. We thought it might be a good time. I'm a writer. I mean, I want to be a writer, and I was hoping it would be a laugh or at least something to write about, but she's the genuine article. We saw things there, and she pointed me out. She told me that Jimmy was going to die and that the ghost, uh, Rebecca, was coming for me next. Slow down. There's no ghost here, kid. This was a flesh and blood murder, just the usual type. Here, have a cigarette. Take the edge off. Help me figure out what happened here. Ray offered the young ensign a cigarette, but Robert abruptly stood at the table and looked immobilized, like a rubber band had snapped tight inside him. Ray turned to see a commanding officer approach Ensign Robert Heinlein with a small group of Marines. He pointed to Robert and gestured that the ensign should immediately join him. With a quick salute, Robert left Ray Rook wordlessly and marched to the commanding officer. Together, they left with the fierceness of the December wind. Ray got up and walked over to the phone booth in the lobby. Pulling the heavy oak and glass panel door behind him, he rung up the office. Yeah. Betty, you still there? Yeah, yeah. Look, I need you to look up Miss Kincaid. She's some sort of mystic or spiritualist. See if you can find a place of business in the directory. Yeah, thanks, doll. I'll ring you later. Ray placed the receiver back on the hook and turned to exit. When he looked out the glass, there she was. Ada Kincaid was the most radiant sparkle in this city, and she stood there in front of him. Ray opened the door to the booth. Good evening, Miss Kincaid. The woman's eyes locked onto Ray, and he couldn't help feeling a bit like a coyote with its paw in a trap. Good evening, Mr. Rook. The woman extended a single graceful hand in a black velvet glove. I was just inquiring after you. Did you happen to see the young sailor leaving just now? He seems to know you. I believe you've been called to me, Mr. Rook. I was told you'd find me. Will you join me and find the answers you seek? Ray pulled out a cigarette and offered one to Ada Kincaid, who graciously took it. As he snapped open the lighter for her, he said, Who was it that mentioned me? I have a short list of fans in this city. I speak for Rebecca Carr. Mr. Rook, tonight we will contact the dead and ask them for guidance and perhaps forgiveness. Our city is in grave peril. Seems to me. Dead might not be the best ones to ask advice on how to stay alive. Ada laughed, and it was a soft, musical sound that made the rough edges of Ray Rook soften a little. <laughs> Mr. Rook, tonight you'll see there is much you do not know. Thank you for joining us for part one of Tacoma Noir. Be sure to tune in for part two, Seance at the Rust Mansion. Tacoma Noir is brought to you by the City of Tacoma's Historic Preservation Office and Pretty Gritty Tours. Mm -hmm.